1995. Before that, she worked for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, first as an Associate Protection Officer in West Africa, then as a legal officer in D.C. In D.C., she often conducted training sessions on refugee law for government officials, immigrant advocates, and other audience. She continues to take on occasional projects for the U.N. High Commissioner for Refugees, and during the summer of 2000, she worked with her father for the War Torn Societies Project International in Croatia. They interviewed a range of Croatians and expats working in Croatia to determine if the climate was right for the project's help in post-conflict reconstruction in that country. She is currently finishing a book entitled Humanitarian Law in Action Within Africa, exploring the various ways in which humanitarian and human rights law serve as a tools of of conflict resolution and transitional justice in countries emerging from protracted civil wars. Her book builds on her field research in Uganda, Burundi, and Sierra Leone, and will be published by Oxford University Press in 2012. Professor Moore is titled, her talk is titled today, Occupy Wall Street and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Professor Moore. introduction might be longer than my talk. <laughs> anyway, it's great to be here. I teach human rights law and international law at the law school, and one of the things that really moves me about the Unoccupy Albuquerque and the Occupy Wall Street movements is the link between those movements and older, long-standing, continuing human rights struggles throughout the world. So a, a part of my talk is really about how I've been inspired by the Occupy Wall Street movement and the local movement here in Albuquerque. Um, I, I wanted to just start on that more personal level that I had the occasion twice to witness and even take part in a General Assembly meeting of the Unoccupy Albuquerque movement here at Yale Park. And it was very, very moving to me to see how the, the movement has taken has taken form here in Albuquerque. Um, one of the things that you all, certainly those of you who are part of the encampment and the, the protest, are aware of is that there's a human microphone in that instead of having an amplification like this, people's voices are, are needed to amplify the words of an individual. So it's a great concept because literally your voice can't be heard unless it is magnified by the voices in unison of other people. So it's a really great idea about collective action. It's also great because it makes you be concise, which is good for a lawyer, and even be a little bit poetic and a little bit um, eloquent in a, in a different kind of way. Um, I'm here to talk about the connections between so-called civil and political rights and economic and social rights. And to me, the Occupy Wall Street movement is bears witness to the fact that the full spectrum of human rights is interconnected and interdependent. And you know, sometimes when folks comment on and even critique the Occupy Wall Street movement, they'll say, what is it? There are so many demands. Is it an anti-bank movement? Is it an anti-capitalism movement? Is it an anti-hunger movement? Is it a social justice movement? Is it a free speech movement? And I would say it's all of those things and that that's essential. There's issues about choices, about priorities, and about recommendations of concrete action that come out of such a broad movement, but it's also a, a very important strength of the movement. So I start by looking at Occupy Wall Street as a human rights movement. And I see it as leading to, as, as being a, a descendant in a long line of human rights movements. And even though there is that continuity, sometimes we need to remind ourselves that we're standing on the, on the shoulders of others where, where, and we can learn by reminding ourselves about lessons learned in past human rights struggles. So I teach human rights law and we tend to focus on treaties and declarations and various documents that are written and signed by states and honored or sadly often honored in the breach as much as honored in the, in the actual practice. But nevertheless, these documents are very important statements of aspiration and statements of obligation. So 
one of my sort of touchstones when I teach human rights law is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I think of as sort of the mother load of human rights instruments. It, it was passed by the United Nations General Assembly in 1948 without dissenting voice. No country in the entire world that was present in the General Assembly at that time, and this is the United Nations General Assembly, voted against the Universal Declaration. And it's given birth to many human rights treaties two international human rights treaties and many regional human rights treaties in Africa, the Americas, Europe, within the Arab League, etc. But I like to even go back before 1948, we could go way back, but I'm just going to go back four years earlier to 1944 when Franklin Delano Roosevelt gave a very important speech called the Four Freedoms Speech. And it was so simple, in fact Norman Rockwell did some famous paintings that have been turned into plates and all kinds of sort of kitschy stuff, but it was very, very all-American, the idea of the four freedoms. And the four freedoms were the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, the freedom from want, and the freedom from fear. So it was the idea that political rights, free expression, the right to practice your religion, not just believe in a certain view of how we all got here, but practice it as well. That those positive rights, the right to do things, to scream and yell within bounds, to, be, to, to express yourself, to participate, those are rights that are important to our democracy. But also po rights that have to do with survival freedom from want, the ability to feed your children, the ability to find housing, employment, generate income, participate meaningfully in, in, in creating a society where people can have their basic needs met, that that was also fundamental freedom. And then the freedom from fear, the freedom from, the freedom that involves protections from political repression, but other forms of repression as well. All of these freedoms were seen as core. And so that really simple speech that FDR gave was really one of the underpinnings of the other Roosevelt, <laughs> Eleanor, um, having a lot to do with drafting the Universal Declaration, a lot to do with creating the United Nations, and a lot to do with drafting many treaties that have tried to go further in obligating states not to repress their citizens and residents in various ways. So, you know, without going into like specific articles and provisions of the Universal Declaration, what's remarkable about it is that it has very specific rights. So it has the right to freedom from torture. It has the right to basic personhood under the law. It has the right to due process, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, but it also has the right to education, the right to enough food to sustain life, the right to social security, the right to a decent standard of living. So it, it has that whole spectrum. And so for me, what is useful about the, U the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is that it remains a great testament to the idea that we need to work on free expression rights at the same time that we need to work on social justice rights. And I think that the Occupy Wall Street movement is many things to many people, but to me, it's, it's insistence on free expression rights as a way of calling for social change is, is just completely essential and, and, needs to, and needs to be respected and strengthened and, and focused upon. I think there's other folks that are no longer with us that would seize on not all aspects of the Occupy Wall Street movement, but certainly these fundamental ones that I'm focusing on. And two would be Martin Luther King Jr. and Dorothy Day. You know, we, we focus on Martin Luther King. It, it, again, many people take many pieces of strength from his work and his life and his vision. 
but one aspect of what he did that is with us is fighting for equality under the law for African Americans and for all residents of the United States. But he was always fighting for social justice at the same time. And in fact, some of the main struggles he took part in in individual cities had to do with bus boycotts and had to do with employment rights and had to do with the connections between equality, employment, and dignity. So that connection between political rights and social rights was very, very key for him. And for Dorothy Day, you know, a Catholic social activist who founded the Catholic Worker, um, there's a lot more to say about her, but she established these Catholic Worker houses, which were centers of political debate and discussion, as well as places where people could come and get shelter and literally break bread and share sustenance together. So I think I'm going to end there and just say that there is that international law, human rights law, weak as it is, is, its weakness is also its strength. It asks for more than we have. It asks for transformation of our political systems and our social systems and our economic systems. And Occupy Wall Street and Unoccupy Albuquerque are important manifestations of that ongoing, that ongoing struggle. So thank you very much. Thank you.